Well, this morning my title of my message is Finding Stability in an Unstable World. So how many believe that we're living in an unstable world today? How many of you are unstable? I won't ask you that. But I think we could all agree that we live in a very unstable world today, and we've seen the devastation of all kinds of hurricanes and fires, and every time it seems like you turn on the news, I can't remember the last time I turned on the news in, in, uh, in St. Louis and there hasn't been somebody shot. Okay, I cannot remember a day that there hasn't been somebody shot or killed. And, uh, and then we just saw in New Zealand 49 people, you know, gunned down, killed. Threat of terrorism. We can't forget the unstable little chubby guy with the weird haircut that has nuclear bombs, you know, that doesn't like the United States. Um, what's his name? Kim Jong whatever yeah uh, do you know over there that they can only have certain haircuts and uh, most of them are, are just like his so but uh, everything that we believe that is wrong is now called right in our society and uh, other than that everything's fine but I know the question back in our minds is, are we living in the last days? And my opinion is, if, if we're not, God is missing a great opportunity <laughs> because uh, the Bible says that no man knows the day or the hour. Uh, and then even in the early church, they thought it was going to be the last, last days, that they were living in the last days. And in the year 999, uh, they thought Christ would return um, before we turned a thousand, and uh, that didn't happen. And in 1939, Hitler started World War II and killed millions of Jews, and everyone thought for sure that he was the Antichrist and uh, Jesus was coming back then. And then in 1999, we had, uh, we thought Jesus was coming back. I remember Y2K. Yeah. Everybody, <laughs> that was the big scare back then, you know, Jesus is coming back. And so here we are in 2019. We have wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, riots, hurricanes, ungodly living, and uh, ungodly living being glorified. So is Jesus coming back? You know, I know he's coming back, but we don't know the day or the hour. No, no man that covers everybody. No man knows the day or the hour. Uh, but Jesus is coming back. I, I have no doubt in my mind because everything that was prophesied about his incarnation came to pass. And everything that uh, was, will, was prophesied about his second coming will happen. It's definite. It, it will happen. And uh, so the question is, 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 are we ready? And uh, am I ready? You know, are we all ready? And Second Peter 3.10, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering uh, to us who believe not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall be dissolved with fervent heat. And the earth and the works uh, there are shall be burned up. Everything's going to be burned up. Seeing that these things are thus, all will be dissolved. Now listen to this. What manner of persons ought we to be in all holy living and godliness? So knowing that Christ is going to come back, we don't know the day or the hour, what, what kind of person should we be? We should be, uh, we ought to be living godly. And uh, I remember a story about a gardener who, 
he took care of this. He was a caretaker of this great mansion, beautiful mansion, and had a beautiful garden. And but the the owner hardly ever came there. But the gardener always took care of the garden. I mean, every day he was out there watering that. And somebody said to him, why, why do you do this, you know? Why do you spend all your time taking care of this garden? And uh, he says, well, you just never know when the master's going to come, when the owner's going to come. And so that's kind of what we're doing, you know. We're, we're maintaining, we're walking with the Lord, but we never know. We always have to be ready. We never know when the Lord's going to come back. We don't know the day or the hour. So... How do we maintain and find stability in a very unstable environment? How do we teach our kids to have stability in an unstable world? We're seeing young people come out of college that don't know how to deal with life. When it doesn't go the way they want, they're not able to cope with it. And if somebody challenges their views, they can't deal with it. Why, why is that? That generation is called the generation of snowflakes. I've never heard that term, that term, snowflake generation. And uh, I thought it was interesting because uh, this article on The Blaze talks about the snowflake generation and what really stresses them out. And listen to these things that stress them out. Losing their wallet or their credit card, not having enough likes on Facebook, traffic delays, losing your phone, being late to work. You know the average uh, span for a, uh, a snowflake or Somebody in that generation, they're, they, only, they're, they only work for about 90 days. That's, that's how long they're able to keep a job nowadays. And uh, another thing that stresses them out is slow Wi-Fi. <laughs> I mean, we came from a generation where we were in wars and, and riots and all kinds of things, and, and slow Wi-Fi, you know, stresses these people out. Phone batteries dying, forgetting passwords, forgetting their phone charger, job interviews, the check engine light when it comes on in the car. Isn't that crazy? And <clears throat> Tim, this guy, uh, Tim Elmore, in an article that he wrote, uh, called Leading the Next Generation about snowflakes. He said it's caused by helicopter parents. These are parents we read about since 2002 that hover over their children, ensuring they get all the best benefits they deserve. And youth sports leagues felt it was important to celebrate participation more than winning. It was uh, understandable that most kids won't win a championship and adults felt that they should not prevent those average players from being rewarded in some way. And a few years, years ago, this man says that he visited a friend's home and he saw his child's room literally filled with trophies and ribbons that had been given, but he'd never won anything. This fosters an expectation of rewards just for showing up. And then there's been great inflation and uh, the average grade given was a C. Why? Because C means average. Today, the average grade is an A. Many adults fear that students cannot handle harsh reality of a C. I mean, you got C's. <laughs> I mean, you survived. That's amazing. <laughs> so, I mean, you got D's. <laughs> I won't go to F's. <laughs> so uh, he said, uh, in one school district where the uh, faculty told me that they were not allowed to use red ink when grading papers, it was too harsh. <laughs> 
I may got some red ink on their paper. I thought that was the only ink she had back then, you know. <laughs> this is red. <laughs> that she liked writing in red. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they, they were not allowed to use the red ink and it was too harsh some told me that they were not permitted to use the word no because it was too negative so you could see why we're dealing with this generation of snowflakes you know and, um, and then there's theology or there's technology and media Parents believe that their kids deserve the latest iPhone or Android, the latest uh, jeans with holes in them, I might add, the latest Xbox. <coughs> now, I come from a generation, and, I, and maybe you can help me with this, but I come from a generation that we threw our jeans out when they had holes in them, but now they buy them when they have holes in them. Maybe somebody can explain that to me. So, you know, they have parents that have to, they have to have the best Nike shoes, a description of Netflix, uh, entitlement and material, materialism usually walk hand in hand when kids are brought up that way. And then we have, and this really gets me, is safe places in colleges. As students, now, this ought to concern you because these are, this is the next generation. These are coming up. These are the ones that are going to be running our country, running your companies. So as students enter college, they began to look for safe places, free from opposition or harsh feedback. At Cornell University, students gathered for uh, for a cry in to mourn the results of the two 2016 presidential election with school staff. Now, they couldn't handle the election, so all the school staff and the students got together and they provided tissues and hot chocolate at the university. These are, these are university students, and they couldn't handle the election. And so they were provided tissues and hot chocolate. And the University of Kansas provided therapy dogs to comfort those in distress by the presidential election. So now, now we have therapy dogs. And I, I was somewhere the other day, and, and in comes a therapy dog. And, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're going to get to that later, but... Uh, do you see what's happening here? People cannot deal with stuff anymore. And so there's no stability. They have no stability. I, I believe that's why you have these people that, you know, they get fired from their job, so they come back and they shoot five people. I mean, when we got fired, we, you know, we'd go to the unemployment office and find another job. Or somebody gets bullied or somebody gets their feelings hurt. They, 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 they don't know how to deal with it. So what's missing in this generation that they can't deal with life? Any ideas? There you go. I mean, we took him out of our schools. We said, God, we don't need you in our schools no more. Thank you. We can handle this. We took the Ten Commandments down, and now we see the results of all that. The same thing that has been missing in the hearts of men and women from generation to generation, rich or poor, educated or non-educated, a millennial or a baby boomer, the Bible says that they have no hope and they are without God in this world. They, they don't have any hope, and the only strength they have is their own. And when they run out of that, they have nowhere to turn. The only hope they have, the only strength they have, the only place they can put their trust is in themselves and the things of this world. They have no refuge to run to. 
But those who walk with God, how many are walking with God this morning? Those who walk with God, we, we don't have to go to a safe place because God is our refuge and he's our strength and he is a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth be removed and the mountains be cast into the sea. The Lord is my refuge and my strength and he's a very present help in time of trouble. Think about that. That's what the Bible says, Selah, think about that. Therefore, we will not fear. So every time I, you know, we all have a go-to place. Sometimes if things get rough, we, we go to the, the bar. Or if things get rough, we'll go to a, a, a drug addiction. If things get rough, we'll go to the icebox. Some people run, they go to different places. But the Bible says that the place we're supposed to go is God because he is our refuge. He's our strength. He's our very present help in time of trouble. I don't need hot chocolate and a tissue because I got the God who created the universe, who hung the stars in the sky, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the everlasting God, uh, the Alpha and the Omega. Why do I need hot chocolate and a tissue? I don't need a comfort dog. I guess we could say that our country is going to the dogs. <laughs> I, I don't get comforted by a dog. I mean, I, you know, dogs are cool and everything, but they're not going to help me when, you know, they might lick you or something. <laughs> they're, they're not going to help me, brother, when I get in trouble, when I, when I you know, when I need help, I'm not going to call Fido. I remember, and you've heard this story before, when I was driving a truck over the road, I would go Highway 57 all the way up to Kankakee, Illinois. And, and then I would turn around and come back all in one night. And, and one night on my way back, I... I uh, I was on 57, and if you ever run 57, it's just all flat, right, Jeff? It's just flat, nothing out there. And uh, so I remember checking the load back there, and there were skids stacked on each other in the back, you know, so I was kind of concerned of that and everything. But as I was heading my way home, I fell asleep. That's not good <laughs> when you're driving a tractor and trailer. And so... I remember waking up and I was in the grass. How did I know that? Because I was going <laughs> and, and I felt the thing starting to lean like that. And I, I, just, I just yelled out, Jesus! And the next thing I knew, I was on the road again. And I thought, wow, this is weird. Am I, am I dreaming this or what? And so the next night, I, I noticed the mile marker. The next night, on my way back, I saw tracks going into the middle, but I saw no one coming back. Now you say, I, I don't know how that happened, but I, I wonder what would have happened if I would have said, holy cow! <laughs> The Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I, and I called on his name because he's my rock, he's my fortress, he's my go-to, he's where I run to, he's my strength, he's my very present help in time of trouble. One way to find stability in an unstable world is to put your trust in God, not in government. Governments come and they go. You know, ours has lasted for quite a while now. We hope that it lasts for a long time. But you can't put your trust in government. If, if you look at most of the letters that Paul wrote, he wrote to churches that were being persecuted because of the government. And 
So we can't put our trust in government, but we have to put our trust in God. And all of us trust something. The word trust means that you rely on it. Every one of us came in here this morning and sat your blessed assurance on those chairs and you trusted that they're going to hold you up. Didn't you? Did any of you doubt, well, I don't know if I'm going to sit here. I don't know if this is going to hold me up or not. You, you, just, you just totally trusted in that chair. Now, we have had a couple collapse. Our older ones. <laughs> So we have, to, we have to have our trust in God. He is our, our help. He is our rock. He is our strength. And trust means to have confidence in something or someone. Misplaced trust is a recipe for disaster. When I have my trust in the wrong thing, I don't trust in people. I don't trust in in the world, I don't trust in government, but when my trust is in the right place, I have victory. Isaiah 31 1 says, Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses and, and trust in chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they are strong. But they look not at the Holy One of Israel, neither do they seek Jehovah. Psalms 125, 1. <clears throat> they that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abides forever. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abides forever. And then it says, as the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so is the Lord round about his people from henceforth even forever. I know that sometimes we're in the midst of trouble and we don't understand what's going on. We don't understand why this is happening or how come we're here. It's hard sometimes for us to shift into trust. But that's where God wants us to act in faith and trust him. You know, I remember uh, the story of Paul and Silas at j in jail, and it says they were in their innermost prison. And it says, at midnight, at midnight, they began to sing and give praises to God. So it's at midnight sometimes that that even though we don't <clears throat> feel like singing, even though we don't trust, feel like trusting, that's when God wants us to do, shift into trust because that's when he's getting ready to bring the earthquake and the victory. And that's what happened with Paul and Silas. The last way to have stability in an unstable world is to make Jesus your rock and your anchor. David said, when my heart is overwhelmed, how many have ever been overwhelmed before? Just, man, I just, I don't, I can't do this. I'm just, I am just overwhelmed. I mean, when your heart is overwhelmed, Lead me to that rock that's higher than I. That's higher than I. The worst thing to do is get mad at God in the middle of, in the middle of, of your trial. We've got to, sometimes we have to pray and say, Lord, lead me to that rock. Bring me to that rock. I don't understand what's going on. I don't know why this is happening to me, but lead me to that rock that's higher than I because I can't deal with this. Say amen or oh me. Amen. Psalms 40. <clears throat> it says, I waited patiently. You know that word should not be in the Bible. 
<laughs> How many would like to erase that word out of there? <laughs> I mean, we live in a drive through society. You know, when we place our order, we like, by the time we get to that window, we want to make sure we got our food. How many have ever put something in the microwave and for two minutes and you stand there and watch it and you think, man, what's taking this thing so long? <laughs> you're only laughing because you're guilty. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined his ear unto me, and he heard my cry. He brought me also out of the horrible pit. You know how you get out of a pit? It, somebody's got to lift you out of it. And he, we have to wait patiently for the Lord. We don't understand it. We don't know why, but we have to wait patiently. He brought me up out of the horrible pit and out of the miry clay. And I like this. He set my feet upon a rock. And he established my goings. And he put a new song in my heart. I like that verse. It says, Thou hast turned my mourning into dancing for me. Thou hast put off my sackcloth. He, is, he had put a new song in my heart and in my mouth. Even praises unto our God. You know that many songs that we sing today, some, a lot of the old hymns, came from people who were in great despair. even praise to our God. Many shall see it. Many shall see it. They don't understand why you have peace through, through the storm, and they, they don't understand why you're, you're, you're holding on, why you have stability in an unstable time or an unstable world. And it says, many shall see it. Why aren't you worried about this? Why aren't you, you know, upset about that? Why don't you have fear about this? because you've made God your rock. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in God. Blessed is the man that makes God his trust and respects not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. You know what keeps man from trusting God pride pride saying I could do this in my own strength I could I could break this I could I could overcome this it's called humanism and pride keeps people from trusting God I I'm not, I can't do anything in my own strength. I, I've come to that place where I, I, I know my limitations. I know what I can't do, but I know what I can do in Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'd rather have the strength of God in the power of God than the strength of my own. I can't even do Christianity without Christ. Just be honest with you. <laughs> Paul ca called it another gospel when you try and do it yourself when you try to make yourself righteous and by works and different things like this. 
Bible says it's not by works of righteousness which we've done, but it's according to his mercy and his grace he saved me. By the washing and regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. And then in Galatians, Paul says, you know, because they wanted to come back under the law. And Paul says, oh, foolish Galatians, have you, have you begun in the spirit? Or are you now made perfect by the flesh? We, we can't even overcome, I can't even overcome nothing without the power of God. The Bible says, mortify the deeds of the flesh by the Spirit. Getting awful quiet in here this morning. So, Psalms 18, 46. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation. That's how you have stability in a stable, in an unstable environment. That's what we have to teach our kids, to trust in the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in thee, Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together because I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. God is my rock and he's my fortress. He's my very present help in time of trouble. I don't need tissues and chocolate because God is my strength and he's my anchor. He's my rock. So don't you think that snowflakes need to hear this? I mean, I'd like to have a whole church full of snowflakes and preach this to them. I would say, man up. The Lord lives and blessed be my rock and exalted be the God of my salvation. Do you see what's happening since we've taken God out of our society for strength and for comfort in our lives and we've, we've had to replace him with comfort dogs and chocolate? That's the best the world can do. But the Bible says that God is the God of all comfort. The Lord lives... Say this with me. The Lord lives, the Lord lives. and blessed be, my rock, blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation. Let's say it again. That wasn't too convincing. <laughs> this, is, this is your confession this morning. The Lord lives. The Lord lives. And blessed be my rock. And exalted be the God of my salvation. Amen. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be safe from my enemies. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. That's not in my notes, but it's a good song. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, I want to end with this song. It's an awesome song. Can I have my worship team come up here? just me and you, brother. <laughs> Come on up, guys. Come on up. Huh? 
This is uh, Carol. It's the solid rock. It's the last song there. Now, while we're singing this this morning, you know, sometimes even as Christians, we start trusting other things instead of God. We get into financial difficulties and we trust in the old MasterCard instead of God. We get facing health issues and many things in our life and sometimes we revert to trusting other things instead of God. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you're that's a void in your life. You don't have God in your life. You, you don't have anything but your own strength and your own power to trust in. As you call upon the Lord this morning, God can meet you right where you're at and strengthen you and give you the power to overcome things. Sing it, boys. <laughs> I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his Place. I'll rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale. My anchor holds with in the red. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Oath is covenant and his blood support me in the whelming flood when all around my soul gives way he then is all my hope and stay on grass the solid rock I stand shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, farthest to stand before the throne. On grass the solid rock I stand. Denise, would you mind us praying for you this morning? Have some people come up and pray for Denise this morning. She's crying out to God. She needs help this morning. She needs window one up here. She needs to be set free from some things. I told her, I said, Denise, come here this morning. She showed up. <laughs> She was late, but she made it. Praise God. I believe God can set her free. And Jesus can be her rock. And her fortress, she doesn't have to depend on what she's had to depend on before. She doesn't have to be let down by the world because God wants to be her strength and her fortress. And a very present help in time of trouble, Denise. You want that? 